sounds? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I am at the Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, in seconds. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I think I can. Uh, cool. Let you. Uh, so, uh, okay. okay, thank you, Florent. Uh, can, uh, so, first, let me thank you, uh, Florent, uh, Jean, and Matteo, for uh, inviting me for this uh, workshop. And, uh, I've been learning a lot of stuff these days. Um, so, uh, today I'm going to present you some work that I did in collaboration with uh, Federica Gerace, uh, Marc Meza, uh, Lenka Zdeborova, and our uh, dear channel uh, uh, chair of the panel, uh, Florent Xacala. And uh, hopefully it's gonna be an easy going talk because uh, it overlaps with a lot of stuff that has been uh, presented previously. So I have in mind, especially the talk by Stefan on Monday and the talk by Sebastian uh, a couple of hours ago. So, um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of uh, repetition, but uh, I think that's good for learning. As we all know, uh, uh, several epochs is always better for learning. So um, let's get into it. So like the million dollar question, what would like to understand it's a uh, generalization uh, in uh, modern machine learning uh, problems. So clearly, if you look, the difference between what we teach undergrads in uh, Stats 101 and how actually generalization curves look nowadays in modern problems, it's pretty clear that there is like a couple of things we don't understand about generalization uh, in, uh, in high dimensional statistics. So, um, you know, if you go around the conference asking people uh, what we are missing, um, of course, the answer, as usual, is going to depend on with who you talk to. So some people are going to tell you that, you know, it's about the architecture, all adding another layer, and uh, that's what makes the difference. Um, while if you talk with other people, they're going to tell that it's all about the algorithms and how they are biased toward the good generalization minima. So we heard about that uh, earlier today. Um, while if you talk with other people, they're going to tell you this is all about the data, right? So selecting the right features for the learning problem in question you want to solve, it's uh, where most of the work should go. So while probably everyone is right, and to have a good theory of deep learning, we we'll probably need a linear combination of the three things. Um, I personally think that data, and uh, I think uh, some other of my colleagues uh, in, the, in the conference are gonna agree, is one of the least explored uh, of the three aspects. So uh, today I'm gonna focus on that. So, when we talk about data, there is basically two theory cultures. The first one being um, uh, worst case analysis, which completely ignore the role of data. So I'm thinking about, you know, worst case in learning bounds like VC type bounds. Um, and the other culture, which is like typical case analysis, which you also heard a lot um, uh, throughout this week, many times model data too simplistically. So just taking, you know, IID Gaussian noise. So the question we'd like to ask in this talk um, is uh, can we do better than that? And uh, if you if you like heard like uh, the other talks, you probably know already the answer. But uh, before diving into that, let me get into a concrete example about uh, worst case versus typical, which is an example that I borrowed from um, oh, sorry from some colleagues uh, um, here in our group in Paris, which is to consider just a very simple classification task of uh, classifying IID Gaussian points with plus or minus one labels, which are assigned by a teacher, um, a teacher one layer neural network um, with uh, Gaussian weights theta. So if you look at like the orange dots, they are like just a, a solver, out of the box logistic regression solver that I got from scikit-learn. And uh, the dashed green is the predicted by like the worst case uh, VC type bound for this problem, which you can actually compute. And uh, if you want to know more, look at the, the reference. It's a very interesting work. And you can see there is a big gap between both of them. Um, in black, you can see like the base optimal, uh, uh, the base, op base optimal prediction, which comes uh, from uh, the theory that uses uh, a prior uh, from the model of the data. And you can see that like tip the typical case, like. Uh, uh, that we get just like using scikit learn is much closer to the base optimal um, than to the worst case analysis. So actually, you know, like taking into account the structure of data uh, 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 actually matters for this problem. So as I said, the question we'd like to answer here is like, can we do better than just getting IID Gaussian points as in my last example? And uh, if you heard about like Sebastian talk, you probably know the answer. Um, 
So the idea here to model like structure of data, so we want, we want a model of data that is actually, you know, still analytically trackable because we want to do theory. So we cannot just get like, you know, the most kind of general data because that's uh, going to be a nightmare to do theory. But we want something which is more complicated than IID, but not too complicated so we can still apply the usual uh, uh, methods we are used to. And the idea here is to uh, model the idea of uh, uh, latent feature space against like the input space. So if you think about like my, uh, my dog and lobster example, uh, we know that for instance, um, we can classify dogs uh, by just looking at whether they have muzzles or not. So a uh, lobster doesn't have a muzzle while a dog has. So there exists a representation of this data, which I would call the latent space representation where uh, the muzzle is one of the coordinates and is low dimension, this representation. And uh, whether like my picture has a muzzle or not, is gonna spike on this coordinate uh, as a yes or no. And I will be able to perfectly separate this easily uh, by just looking at this space. So that's the idea that uh, Sebastian previously introduced uh, for the hidden manifold model. So here we take um, a data set X and Y, where X is generated from a linear combination of um, latent uh, vectors. And we take the labels just to depend on the latent representation. So Y is just gonna depend on C that lives in a low dimensional uh, latent feature space. And my X, which is the data that I'm gonna be given to the statistician, or if you want to the student, if you, if you, if you like to think in terms of teaching student, uh, is gonna be hidden uh, by a projection into a higher dimension space, uh, followed by a non-linearity, so that the problem is not linear and it's non-trivial. And notice that the scale, the scale here is such that when I take the high dimensional limit of like, you know, the latent dimension, uh, the input dimension, and the number of samples to infinity while keeping the ratio fixed, everything scales nicely. So um, what is the aim of this work? Is to study classification and regression on this uh, hidden manifold data set. Um, different from, for example, what uh, Sebastian had presented, which was the online learning uh, for that. Here we are interested in the full batch uh, uh, problem. So, um, both classification and regression can be put under the umbrella of uh, generalized linear models. So uh, my labels, like the, my predicted labels are gonna be a non-linearity applied to a weight uh, dot my data set, my input uh, 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 vector. And uh, I'm gonna fit, choose my weights by minimizing a loss, which can be uh, quite general, plus a regularization term, a read regularization term, a L2 penalty. So by choosing my F0 and F, to be, for example, uh, the identity, I'm gonna get like regression task. If I choose to be a sign function, I'm gonna get a uh, uh, classification task. And by choosing the loss, I can choose also the, the different tasks. For example, I choose a logistic loss, I'm gonna get logistic uh, regression. So um, we are gonna study into this generalized uh, linear model framework, and then after we're gonna draw the consequences for different tasks. So uh, it's quite interesting because this, uh, this data set with this linear task, can be interpreted in a completely different way. So in fact, if we look to the feature coordinate C as being the data points, which were the role previously paid by X, and we incorporate the feature map on the model side instead of the data side, it becomes just a two layer neural network where we're fixing the first layers with weights F, which previously were the projections, and we're only training the second layer with weights W. So the nonlinearity sigma becomes the activation function for the hidden units. And this model is closely related um, to the random features uh, model introduced by uh, Hacking High Me to study uh, kernel, uh, kernel tasks uh, in finite dimensions. So um, in particular, I also have in mind that your work by uh, Song Mei and Montanari who studied exactly the setting uh, for uh, the rich regression task. So by taking F hat to be equals to the identity and the uh, loss to be the square loss. So uh, they observed a double descent peak there and um, basically we are gonna discuss some generalizations of that uh, for other tasks. So um, this is the, 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 the random project, projection point of view, which I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna spend uh, much time on that because uh, we don't have time, but uh, it's good to keep in mind that we have these two pictures of the same model. So what is our main result? Uh, I, I don't want to deep dive into anything technical, but uh, we use uh, statistical physics methods to derive it. But my, our, main, our main result is a generalization error and training loss formula uh, for this problem in the asymptotic high dimensional limit. So uh, bear with me, the formula looks a bit complicated, but uh, you know, 
is, uh, is, uh, is not so hard to understand. Actually, what it's telling you is that the generalization and training loss only depend on a couple of uh, low dimensional parameters. Um, these low dimensional parameters can be obtained by solving a, a, a set of points like equations. So you just plug in the computer these equations, which look complicated, and then you iterate them and you're gonna get the generalization and, uh, and training loss. And then you can, uh, you can see that like, it depends both on the loss, which is general there, um, depends on the, on the task that you choose, which is parameterized by the F0 as, a, as a previously discussed. Um, and it depends on the matrix F only through the spectrum of FF transpose. So only by the Stutes transform of FF transpose. So it holds for quite general Fs as long as the spectral measure of FF transpose is defined in the high dimensional limit. And you might ask where the information about the sigma which are the pre-activations of the first layer in the random features uh, picture, go, well, they just appear as some coefficients um, on the equation. So um, in particular, as I said before, uh, if you choose the square loss and the, and, the, and the task to be rich regression, we recover the results of uh, May and Montanari. So let me just uh, uh, go quickly into that because Sebastian already spent a lot of time into the gets, but uh, the main, like the main, uh, uh, let's say, technical tool that you use to solve this uh, replica computation is the Gaussian equivalence principle uh, that was discussed previously. So this was first observed uh, uh, by, uh, by Sebastian Gold uh, in a paper uh, and also by, was uh, hinted by uh, May and Montanari. And uh, what is actually nice now that I can say that has been proven, as you have heard, so uh, is a rigorous result, especially in this setting of a single layer uh, uh, hidden manifold model. So, okay, let's now move to the consequences of the formula. Um, the first thing I would like to analyze is a simple classification task where, uh, with the square laws and uh, taking the nonlinearity to be an uh, error function, but actually the discussion goes through from any other lead to nonlinearity. As you saw, it just depends on the, the equations only depend on uh, some coefficients uh, of this nonlinearity. So a um, couple of things to observe here. On the left, I have the generalization curve as a function of the sample complexity, I'm fixing the number of latent to input dimensions to be 0 0.1. And I'm plotting for different uh, regularizations uh, uh, lambda. So you can see that uh, the like there is a maximum peak of uh, generalization error in uh, sample complexity equals to one. So this can be understood easily from uh, random matrix theory, because in this case, we have a closed form solution in terms of the pseudo uh, inverse. Um, so it's, uh, there is nothing fancy there. And uh, on the right, I'm plotting a heat map of the generalization error uh, as a function uh, of the number of latent to input dimensions. So we can see that for very low latent to input dimensions, we can always achieve good generalization, which kind of mimics this intuition that if there are only very few latent dimensions like the muzzle, uh, we are able to actually classify well uh, pretty, pretty, pretty easily. So next, uh, let's look at uh, keep like the, the classification task. But let's look at uh, different losses. So here we're comparing logistic against, uh, against square loss. Um, and we're also plotting like uh, the training loss down there. And you can see that the peak in generalization, now I'm plotting things uh, as a function of the inverse of the sample complexity, which is like, uh, you can see this uh, as, a, as a measure of, uh, of um, complexity of your model. And you can see that the peak on the logistic is slightly before than the peak uh, for the square loss. And both of them happen at the interpolation threshold where um, the training loss goes to zero. So um, while I said that like for the, for the square loss, this is related to the PCL inverse, for the logistics it's a bit more complicated and is actually related to the separability threshold that uh, I'm gonna discuss uh, in another slide very soon. But uh, keep that in mind. So uh, now let's, let's analyze the effect of the different Fs, so the different projection matrices F. So here I plot for both like uh, ridge regression task and logistic regression. And you can see that like uh, orthogonal projections always outperform uh, uh, random Gaussian projections. Um, in particular, they tend to the same limit for infinite number of parameters, which is the kernel limit. But for finite number of parameters, if you want to approximate the kernel limit, it's always better to choose a orthogonal projection rather than a Gaussian uh, projection. And this thing has been observed previously um, in a work by Chodomansky, Roland and Veller, 
and here our model provides like a, a concrete setting where we can explore these questions uh, with uh, analytically tractable theory. Okay, so um, before finish, I would like to come back to the position of the peak in logistic regression. Um, um, as probably uh, a lot of you know, when you take the number of parameters, so when you project your data in very high dimension spaces, so when P is very large, we can always separate data linearly. So a, a valid question to ask is, what is the number of, uh, what is the critical P uh, such that you can uh, uh, separate your data uh, perfectly for both like um, um, random and, uh, and orthogonal projections. And uh, this is what I'm plotting here. And you can see that uh, as I mentioned before, uh, orthogonal projections always outperform uh, Gaussian projections and you can predict exactly the separability threshold uh, uh, for, any, uh, for any sample com complexity. So uh, in particular, uh, when the dimension is very large and the data becomes Gaussian ID, we recover the cover transition, which is uh, at sample complexity equals to two. So inverse sample complexity equals to 0 0.5, which is a classical result in the geometric uh, theory. Um, so um, this generalizes the work by Candes uh, uh, exactly uh, uh, for IID data to more complex data sets. So, okay, uh, just to conclude, I see I'm running out of time for with some uh, perspectives. So uh, here we have just looked at very simple tasks. Uh, the one question we, we could ask is, for example, what is the effect of training F? So learning the best representations in high dimensions. So uh, this is something that uh, would be interesting to look at and uh, to look at uh, harder tasks. And uh, another thing that we can uh, look at is, uh, can we learn, uh, can we do the same thing for, uh, for a deeper uh, uh, generative models, such as the ones that uh, Sebastian uh, was describing. And uh, this is something also uh, we are looking at at the moment and uh, I find quite exciting uh, to look at uh, uh, some uh, more uh, deep architectures. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, if you're interested to know more about the technical details, please do check our paper on the archive or write me a note.